Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, but so long story short, I think uh, there's a famous curse. May you live in interesting times. Um, but I think you live in very interesting times. And I think like the world around you right now is incredible. Well, well, here's the deal. Does it or like yeah. does a lower middle class person living in North America right now who's scraping to get by and has it pretty rough live better than most kings lived 300 years ago? Like when you actually stop and think, I'm serious. You think like, especially if you're born in Canada, and listen, Canada's not perfect. We, oh boy, do we have problems. Real, serious, meaningful okay. problems that we need to address. But having said that, born in Canada, you have access to better health care than anyone in the world had access to 10 years ago. Now, having said that, our health care should be better. It should be faster. It should be swifter. You shouldn't wait for the things you wait for. There's some things that cost money that absolutely should not. You know, why it is that everyone gets free. You know, if, you, if, any, if you're having heart trouble, that's free for anyone. You know, if you have a kid who, uh, if you have a kid who has a problem with, uh, you know, most of their body, yeah, it'll be covered. Oh, but your kid has uh, dental issues; they need braces. Oh, sorry, pay thousands, and thousands of dollars. Either you can afford, it or you can't. It's criminal. It's wrong. It's not right. Um, oh, oh, you're sick. Yeah, you can see the doctor for free. Oh, but you need medicine. Oh, no, you're going to pay for that. It's criminal. It's wrong. Um, so our country's not perfect. But having said that, seriously, think about this. Imagine being alive. A thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, and you're a king, a literal king, you know, like the richest person in your country. So lots of things you'd have access to that you don't now, right? You boss people around, they can do things for you, hey, go farm my field or whatever. Having said that, seriously, you don't have indoor plumbing. You don't have running water. Uh, seriously, you can't, uh, you want to listen to a piece of music, you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to listen to that right now. You want to read something, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to read that right now. You want to watch something that doesn't even exist, you have to like, go to a play where people are, you know what I mean? So it's interesting when you think, I mean, you live in a time where you have luxuries and things available to you that people have never had before. It's really interesting, right? Um, on the other hand, people have never been sadder. Actually, like all the studies show that. People have never been sadder. People have never been more stressed out. People have never been more disconnected. And... I think, I think technology, I think AI, I think like all these things, I think social media, I think the fact that we carry our, you know, our social networks around with us like this instead of doing like what we did when I was your age, which was, I don't know, like, I, I always say the thing that always jumps out at me is that like when I started my career, any moment where I was quiet, the class would just erupt into a din, right? Like there'd just be, and like you turn around, people would be playing cards and you'd be like, guys, I stopped talking for like a minute. Right, but like the instinct of everyone was just to immediately be social, right? Like just to, and it, it could be annoying as a teacher, but it was also like it was always kind of like, yeah, these guys are friends and they chat with each other. And now we are so immediate, which is good actually. We are so now immediately programmed to just go inward and just be like, Whoop. and I think we're all. I think we are actually as an entire society uh, oh, horribly, horribly. Ad no, I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that. I'm very hopeful. I think your generation is as smart as any generation that's ever been around, though I think you know less. I think you're less educated. And I, you want to know whose fault I think that is? That would be us. That would be, that would be me. That would be the people who get paid to educate you. I think we're screwing some pretty major things up. Um, but I think, I think you're as smart as any ever. I think you're kinder. I'll tell you right now. It may not feel like your high school is a very kind place sometimes. You may look around and be like, there's a lot of douchebags around here. But I'll tell you something. It's a much kinder place than school was when I was your age. I, I think you're more tuned in. I think you're generally more socially conscious and kind, you know. Hit with a stick, no. Uh, no, but like my dad did. Uh, but, but I, uh, A, I was a pretty well-behaved kid. No, I, when I was a kid, uh, corporal punishment was out. That kind of ended in, say, the 70s. And I think we can all agree that, you know, we don't need to be hitting kids to teach them. Um, and listen, I get it. You give me a stick and tell me I can hit kids, I'm going to hit some kids, but that's not a good Mr. idea. Orlando. No, I'm not actually. I, I am a, I'm reporting. Joking aside, I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in violence to solve problems. I don't think it works. I think violence begets violence. Yeah, I... I Yeah. No, I, I think, like, we have come a long way in terms of teaching kindness and respect. we got a long way to go. <laughs> we got a long way to go. But we're making strides. Whereas when I was a kid, like, I don't think anybody cared that that stuff happened. 
I don't think the teachers cared. I don't think, like, it was just kind of viewed as, yeah, that's part of it. You got to live with that and get over it. And, like, whatever, you, like, that's true. You do. Like, you, your life can't end because people are mean to you. You got to push through and figure it out. But on the other hand, you're like, or we could just stop kids from doing that. That's another thing we could do. We could just say, like, hey, it's not okay to be awful to people. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Oh, listen, I agree. The the power, the the good of technology is incredible, and the bad of it is also incredible. And I don't know where that line gets drawn. I really don't. I don't know what it looks like. Anyway, here's what I do know. I know yesterday we talked about scientific notation. Um, and we talked about scientific notation because it helps us deal with big numbers and small numbers. And if you missed yesterday, don't worry, I'll, I'll get you caught up on it. But long story short, we're going to get it by practicing. But basically, instead of writing this, where we write a three and six zeros, what we do instead is we write a three, and then we say, hey, throw six zeros on there. And you can see that's a little bit shorter than that. Not that much shorter than that, but a little bit shorter. But the other thing it is, how easy would it be to miss a zero when you write this out? I think it'd be pretty easy, right? Whereas here, you don't have to write the zeros. You say, hey, there's six of them. Does that make sense? So that's all scientific notation is. It's just a way of saying, okay, we're going to write this number. Why did I erase that? That was part of the note. Or was that, did I just do that now? Hey, that's great. Can I tell you, that bodes really well because this is the kind of stuff we're doing now. Now, today is going to feel confusing at first. But today you're going to see why we use scientific notation. Because today we're going to talk about the fact that atoms are really small. They're really small. Or more accurately, atoms are just the size atoms are. As it happens, you and I are really, we're really big. We are really, really, really freaking big. We are a lot of atoms put together. So um, this is a lot of writing. Uh, but just really quickly, I want to put this in a context. Uh, this unit's all about quantities in chemical reactions. What's quantity mean? What's quantity? Like amount of something? Numbers, amounts, good. Quantum physics is all about uh, working with, well, we'll talk about that if I teach you physics. But anyway, um, so by the end of this unit, we're not just going to say that like, oh, we can burn magnesium and get magnesium oxide, but we're just going to go one step further and say, okay, if I burn 10 grams of magnesium, this is how many grams of magnesium oxide I should get. Does that make sense? Or if I take 50 grams of this and 30 grams of that, I should get this much of this thing, this much of this thing, and maybe this much stuff left over. We're going to take everything we've been doing, and we're just going to look at it with amounts, which if you think about it makes sense, because if you're actually going to do chemistry, it's not enough to say, okay, put magnesium and oxygen together. A good follow-up question would be, okay, how much? Right? If my wife sends me to the store and says, okay, uh, buy eggs, my follow-up question will be, okay, how many? Does that make sense? And that's what this unit is about. How many eggs? How much bread? So let's just look at a simple reaction. If we took solid magnesium and we react it with oxygen gas, which I can just write as an O, because that's what oxygen looks like. Sorry, what's that? No, I don't know what that means. I just know that O is the symbol for oxygen. It's on the periodic table right there. Yeah, Mg plus O. Good. Evan, are you let me bully you like that? Come on, stand up for yourself. What were you trying to tell me? What was Evan trying to tell me? Look how easily you guys just fold like laundry when I stand up for myself. I know. I'm intimidating. I'm very tough. First thing people notice about me. I'm always right. Anyway, what were you going to say, my friend? Yeah, it's one of our diatomic elements. It's always O2, right? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, another gentleman back there is just way too quick for me, but magnesium wants to give away how many electrons? Two. And oxygen wants to take how many electrons? And I'm not even going to draw the little chart. That's a nice, easy combination, right? So what's the formula? Okay. But of course, here we have a little problem. We need to do what with this equation? Yeah, we got to balance it. And the reason we have to balance it is this says if you bounce one magnesium into an oxygen gas, which is two oxygens, the magnesium will stick to one of the oxygens. And as written, that doesn't work because what happens to the other oxygen? And the answer is that this doesn't happen if one magnesium hits an oxygen molecule. In fact, the oxygen molecule has to bump into not one magnesium, but 
two. And it won't make one magnesium oxide, it will make two. Good. Does that make sense? So what this says, and then we don't have to write this because I wrote it here, um, this tells us that two magnesium atoms should react with a single oxygen molecule to produce two formula units, two of these MgO, magnesium oxides. Okay, here's my question. You guys can all cook basically, right? Like if I asked you guys to make macaroni and cheese, you'd be cool, you could figure it out? You'd know to use milk, not like Kool-Aid? We tried that once, it wasn't good. Um, anyway, uh, so let's just say for the sake of argument, what if I, instead of using two magnesiums, what if I used four magnesiums? Could I do that? Anything stopping me? If instead of throwing two magnesiums at oxygen, I threw four? Probably I'd throw the oxygen at the magnesium instead because it's a gas and all, but you get the idea. If I used four magnesium atoms, how many oxygens would I need? Yeah, four atoms, which means I would need a total of how many molecules? Two of them, right? Because two times two is? Yeah, does that make sense? So yeah, I need four oxygen atoms, and I can get that with two molecules. How many magnesium oxides would I get? How many? Four. Good. Does that make sense? Now, the reason we don't write the recipe like this is because we like to use the simplest version of it that'll work. Does that make sense? But this is actually the same recipe. Does that make sense? And recipe is a term we use in food, but really this is the same formula, isn't it? It's the same reaction. Because... You know that you can double a recipe, you can triple a recipe. What if instead of two magnesiums, I had used 2,000 magnesium atoms? Could I do that? Sure, what's stopping me? How many oxygen molecules would I need? Well, what did I multiply this by? Yeah, I multiplied it by 1,000, so how many of these would I need? If I had 2,000, that would mean having the same number of oxygen molecules as magnesium atoms, right? But if you look here, how many magnesium atoms did I use in the basic recipe? Oh, so just 1,000. Yeah, so just 1,000, right? Does that make sense? All we're doing is we're taking the recipe and we're multiplying it all by 1,000. And how many magnesium oxides would I get? 2,000. 2,000, that's right. Does that make sense? What if I really wanted to go big, like really big? Like really, really, really big. And what if I wanted to use a trillion? Ooh. First of all, I'm not going to write that there. What if I used two trillion, which is 10 to the 12? Really? I like that. What if I used two trillion magnesium atoms? How many trillion oxygen atoms would I need to use? If I used two trillion magnesium atoms... How many oxygen molecules? One trillion. So that'd be one times 10 to the 12. And by the way, for anyone who wasn't here yesterday, that's just a one with 12 zeros. We see why scientific notation is nice. That's a lot quicker than writing 12 zeros, yeah? And how many magnesium oxides would I expect to get? Two trillion. Two trillion. Good. Does that make sense? So this is just a recipe that we can scale up or scale down however we want. Does that make sense? But here's the problem. Even a trillion atoms. Do you know how big a trillion atoms is? No, it's tiny. It's tiny. Here's the thing. This is, uh, just to show you one thing, the smallest thing we can currently kind of take a picture of is uh, like groups of atoms together where we can see their shape. This is a real micrograph. Now, it's not made with a light microscope like this. This is made with a special microscope that takes a very, very, very thin sample and bombards it with electrons. It's called an electron microscope, and it can see very tiny things. How expensive is it? Millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and so this is taking a picture of this. But do you see, even at that scale, can we see hydrogen atoms? This is like, as of like eight years ago, this was as fine a picture we could take. And even then, we're not really seeing the atoms at all. We're kind of seeing the bonds between them. Does that make sense? Now, that's still pretty cool because our math had told us that this is what this molecule looked like, and then when we finally got a picture of it, you know what we saw? It looks like that. Isn't that cool? Like, that's pretty neat, right? It's pretty crazy. It kind of looks like a parasite. Sure, but it's much, much, much smaller. Like, much. Like, there's no comparison. A parasite would be 
trillions of times bigger than this because this is a single molecule. It does, doesn't it? Um, but the main thing to take away is this. Even this number, which now we're dealing with stupidly big numbers, right, is tiny. Um, it's more accurate to say we're really big. So here we go. I've got a story for you. Uh, David Blattner wrote a book called Spectrum, and he did some, do you know the expression back of the napkin calculations? My grandfather was a math teacher. He had a PhD in mathematics from Queen's University. He breathed, he, there were th three things in life my grandfather cared about. Hockey, jazz, and math. <laughs> it's my grandpa Orlando. Um, and food, I guess four. And if you sat and talked with him, he'd talk you off, but I had him. But he used to bribe me. He wanted me to be like a competitive mathematician. So I used to do all the math contests and he would train me. And he used to write the exams, like make the exams. So he like knew what kind of questions were gonna be on them. So I would always score really, really well, which implied I was really good at math. But really, I just had somebody telling me what the questions were gonna be. I was half cheating, really. I didn't know it at the time. But he would sit me down at the dinner table and be like, I'll give you pie if you do this math, room qu math question. And be like, I'll give you ice cream if you do this one. I'll give you ginger ale if you do this one. My eight-year-old self was like, sign me up. So I got two things, fatter and better at math. But um, a back of the napkin calculation, what I wish I had is my grandfather would always just literally on the dinner napkins would always help me. So if I couldn't get a question, he'd get a pen, always a pen. That's a real flex, by the way. If you're doing math in pen, it tells you that you're not worried you might make a mistake, right? And he'd get his napkin out and he'd help me. And I wish I had kept those because I always, I'd keep them for a while, right? And I had these things and I would literally in my school notebook have my grandfather's napkin uh, there. Yeah. Oh, um, your grandfather had a block collection. That was my other grandpa, yeah. Oh, okay. I had two of them. Okay. Yeah, th this grandpa had a book collection that uh, was wild. Yeah. I knew his grandfather, but my grandma. Yeah. On the napkin? Yeah, so he, do you have any of them still? Uh, I might. If you come across one, do yourself a favor and like put it in a frame or something. You don't have to like put it on the wall, but just keep it. Because I'll tell you this, um, my, I don't have anything left that my grandfather wrote, but my cousin Mike, um, when my grandpa died, my grandpa died in 2001 on Christmas Eve, and my cousin Mike kept one of his journals. Um, and it was really neat. And a couple of years ago, he lent it to me. Um, and I read through it. It was, it was really neat. It was from when he was like 20. And so it was really, really neat because obviously by the time I knew my grandpa, he was 60, right? Um, it was really neat to hear like a 20 year old guy, like, you know, but the cool thing was seeing his handwriting too, which just came back to me like a wave. I just remember that handwriting so vividly. And uh, my grandfather was a, a real deep thinker. He was a real reader. And so my cousin has actually a tattoo of something from my grandpa's journal that's just like traced out on it. And I just love it. Every time I see it, I'm like, oh, A, you're in good shape. I should not skip arm day or just any of the days. I don't go to the gym. I don't, I don't go to the gym. But the second thing I think is, oh, my grandpa's handwriting. It's so pretty. Whenever someone asks, oh, how did you guys do this? And his grandma. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So they'd always be filled up. So he dumped most of them on the table and he'd make me and my brother count it out. I love it. Like, okay, that's how many total. And like, if we got it right, he'd let us give you some of the money. That's awesome. And I was like, I don't, I don't need all that because there's no trick. Can I tell you two things? One, your grandma sounds amazing. Two, your grandma's a good teacher. Um, listen, guys, if I had big buckets of money up here and I could teach you chemistry and have you split the money, I'd do it, but I don't. Um, that's awesome. Okay, so this guy David Blattner wrote a book, and he, I love this kind of math question, this kind of thing where it's like, okay, how many grains of sand do you think are on Earth? And I don't have time to go through his math, but it's a great thing to ask yourself, how would you start answering that question? When I say grain of sand, I mean an individual piece of sand, right? And if you've ever been to the beach, you know it feels like after a trip to the beach, you've got a million pieces of sand just on you. And by the way, you probably have hundreds of millions of pieces of sand on you, right? So how does he come up with a number? And what he came up with, and I don't have time to go through the math, but is about 7 times 10 to the 18, which again, remember, what's scientific notation tell me? That tells me 7. And then what's times 10 to the 18, another way of saying? 18 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 
I, I lost count. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. I'm not lying. Does anyone know how many people are on Earth? It's about 8 billion, right? So that's 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million, 100 million, billion. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, I screwed up. I need the zero. Then the billion. Okay, so what's the more of on Earth? Sand or people? Sand, a lot more, right? In fact, how many times more? 10 times more? 100 times more? 1,000 times more? 10,000 times more? 100,000 times more? Million times more? 10 million times more? 100 million times more? Um, so I actually screwed up. I said a million times more, but it's actually a billion. A billion times more. Oh, a million times a million. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. Uh, so that is about give or take, 200 million grains of sand for every single living person on Earth. A lot of sand on Earth, right? Um, this seems like a really big number. Big number? If you wanted to count how many grains of sand on Earth, you'd be at it a long time, right? In fact, you couldn't do it. You'd die long before you could. Um, I always think about stars. Another one of these back of the napkin. Um, scientists disagree pretty strongly about the number. Part of the problem is, we know that there's stars that we can't see because they're so far away that the light hasn't reached us yet. The universe isn't old enough for light traveling at the speed of light to get to us. We call that the edge of the observable universe, and it will never reach us because, in fact, those things are getting farther away, not closer. So there's a whole universe that we literally cannot ever see and never will. Isn't that kind of weird? Weird, right? Um, so it's impossible to know how many stars are out there because we know that we can't see them, but the estimate of the observable universe is about 7 times 10 to the 22 stars. That's 7 with 22 zeros. In other words, if you wanted to give a star to every grain of sand on Earth, you could actually give every single grain of sand 1,000 stars because that's how many stars there are in the observable universe. And by the way, that's almost certainly an underestimate of how many stars are out there. And if we remember, there was about a billion grains of sand for every person on Earth, so that means there's about 7 trillion stars for every single person on Earth. Seven trillion, that's a lot. Now to give you some context, take a look at your fingernail, your pinky fingernail. Now some of you have very, like, does anyone here have like fancy long fingernails right now? My daughter just got hers done for a wedding last week. They're beautiful, they're very nice, very fancy. Um, I bite mine because somebody always takes the nail clipper out of my bathroom. I bought a really nice nail clipper on Amazon and I'm too cheap to buy another one, I refuse. And I hide it. I hide it in my cabinet so nobody will go into my bathroom and steal it. And you know what they still do? They steal it and I go to clip my nails and I don't have it. So I just have to like bite them. I could probably go look, but I'm not doing that. Anyway, um, your little fingernail weighs about one gram. It's a pretty boring. And it says bone. It's not bone. It's keratin. Biology teacher. Oh, my God. But it is made up of about 7 times 10 to the 22 atoms. In other words, your pinky fingernail has in it as many atoms as there are stars in the universe. Just think about, and I, like, actually think about that for a minute. That is an astounding number. Atoms are tiny, all right? Um, uh, this was me getting poetic, I guess. It was late at night, and uh, my five-year-old was really sick. There are more water molecules in a single human tear than there are people who've ever lived. Isn't that weird to think about? Lots more, lots, lots, lots more. Um, by the way, this is a quite challenging question. How many people do you think have ever lived? Not alive right now, but those like 8 billion people on the earth right now, how many billion humans have there ever been? We don't have time for that right now, but there you go. All right, so here we go. Long story short, we can rule out counting individual atoms in labs. The problem with this is that chemical reactions are based on counting atoms. Does that make sense? But you know what's impossible to do? Count atoms. You cannot do it. It's impossible. The numbers are too big. Anything you would actually do on a human scale, you can't count. We cannot go into the lab and count atoms. So what do we do? If you can't count them, what can you do? Well, what does the periodic table tell us about different atoms? We know that different atoms have different, well, they have different numbers of protons, but that would involve counting something even smaller than an atom. That would involve counting protons in the nucleus. We can't do that. So that's useless to us. What else is different about atoms? Well, they have different numbers of neutrons and electrons. Same thing. They're too small. We can't count them. 
What else is different about each atom? They weigh different things. Does that make sense? So I can't count things in the lab. Can I weigh things in the lab? Yeah, of course I can, right? Because that can be done very cheaply. That can be done if you don't even have a scale, but you have something where you know how much it weighs. If you can get like a couple pieces of string and a meter stick, you can make a balance and you can start weighing things, right? You can weigh things pretty easily. You can even roughly weigh things by going like, okay, I know how much, I know that this is a one pound weight here. Yeah, those feel pretty close. I used to, when I worked in a fish restaurant, uh, we had to like cut fillets and we had to cut uh, 10 ounce, eight ounce and six ounce uh, trout fillets, for example. Man, I got to the point where I could look at a piece of trout and be like, I'm gonna cut here, 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 and here, and I'm gonna get four 12 ounce cuts, this, that, and then I would do it and I'd put them on the scale and it'd be like, nailed it. You can get pretty good with weights, right? Humans are pretty good at that. We have a good sense. If you pick up two things, you can tell me which one weighs more, which one weighs less. You can probably even tell me roughly how much. You'd be like, that feels like that's about twice as heavy as that. Do you know what I mean? And then obviously with a digital scale, we can get really accurate. So the fact that we know how much atoms weigh means that instead of working with counting, which is, as we said, impossible, we can work with weights. Does that make sense? Okay. Quiet. So, shh, look here. So the problem is chemistry is done with counting in, the theor in theory, but it's done with weights in the lab. Does that make sense? And we have to make the two things talk to each other. And the answer is we need a number of atoms that is like big enough that when we weigh it, it'll be a good reasonable weight. Does that make sense? Because we're not gonna weigh things in atomic mass units, right? Because again, if this is 10 to the 22 atoms, let's say we had this much hydrogen. Am I gonna go and get a scale and read that, oh yeah, we just weighed out your thing and it weighs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 atomic mass units. Am I gonna do that? No. Oh my God, no, that's ridiculous, right? So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a number where we say, okay, if we had this many atoms, then it's gonna have a weight that we can work with. Does that make sense? You're used to this because you know that we don't sell things individually always, right? If you go to the store to buy batteries, they probably don't sell you one battery, certainly not like AA batteries. Those usually come in either a four pack or an eight pack or you can get the big like 22 pack, right? Um, if you go to the store to buy hot dog buns, what do those come in? Usually eight packs, yeah? If you go to the store to buy um, donut, if you go buy donuts, what do they usually come in? Oh, come on. Uh, that can depend on it has a weird word. We actually give this one a name. Dozen. Dozen, Dozen which means how many? Twelve. Twelve. Interesting. Right? Um, if you go, uh, does that make sense? So we, we're used to buying things in packs. Does that make sense? So when we do chemistry, we're going to start working with volume packs. All right? In other words, you know you go to Costco and like you want mouthwash, but there's like a four pack of mouthwash and you're like, that's a lot of friggin' mouthwash. But they sell it in bulk, right? We do chemistry in bulk. And I just wanna quickly um, just look at this. We're using something called a counting number. And counting numbers, we're gonna use one called the mole. But before we get to the mole, let's just, because the mole, we're gonna introduce it today and then we're gonna go our separate ways and then tomorrow we're gonna actually do some math with it. But really quickly, you're used to counting numbers because counting numbers could be dozen and you know what dozen means. If I say you have a dozen, it means you have 12. What if I said you have, um, uh, what if I said you had a pair? That would mean you had two. two. What if I said you had, um, you probably don't know this one. This used to be used, this is old timey, score. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. Nope. 20. So you know in French they say 80 to say to say 80. I have no idea how you spell those things. But that literally means uh 20 means 20. And I'm just changing the spelling of this randomly and 4 means 4. So literally when the French say the word 80 they say it by saying 420s, which first of all Thank God we don't do that in English high school or I'd be getting nice every time. But anyway, uh, though that has faded away a little bit in recent years, which is nice. Anyway, um, but that's how the French say the word 80, which by the way is ridiculous. But I remember, I distinctly remember being in school 
to age myself here, when we used to have to say the date, and I remember, because I went to a school where they did French right from kindergarten, and we used to have to say, aujourd'hui, so say, lundi, uh, so like today is Monday, uh, le, and then we had to say the date, right? And then we'd say the year. And I remember that we used to say, 1989. I remember that. And I remember coming back after the New Year's, after the Christmas break, and all of a sudden we had to say uh, 90, switching from saying 1989 to 1990. But how they say 90, 90, 420s and 10 more. That's how the French say 90. No wonder they're better than us at math. They have to do math just to say a number. Think about that. 4 times 20 and 10 is how they say the word 90. They're teaching you multiplication, just teaching you to count. It's pretty smart, right? Actually, it's a really ridiculous way to say it. I like 90 way better. But anyway, um, so uh, score actually says the same thing. Before we said 80, before the word 80 existed, we said four score. And score means 20, so 80 was 420s. Nice. Um, so these are counting numbers. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, the most common is probably a dozen. There's 12 and a dozen. So if you got a dozen donuts, that means you have 12 of them. My daughter keeps threatening to get a cat, and I told her she can't get a cat. And then one day she told me she was going to get two dozen cats. If my daughter got two dozen cats, how many would that be? Okay, and you just did some pretty sophisticated math, actually, and we're going to look at it here. Because we know that one dozen is equal to 12 of something. By the way, it doesn't matter what the thing is. Can you have a dozen cats? I mean, not unless you're a crazy person, but could a crazy cat lady have a dozen cats? Sure. Could you have a dozen donuts? I will tell you the truth story. When I was in grade seven, my sister got a job at Tim Hortons, and she came home from her first shift and brought home the like leftover donuts, which was two dozen, and we both sat down and ate a dozen each, and she quit the next day, deciding that she would probably like become horribly unhealthy if she kept working at Tim Hortons. Then she got a job at Arby's, which she didn't like, so she didn't need Arby's. But can I tell you something? I love Arby's. Yeah. Stuff's delicious. I used to go visit her at work, and I'd pretend I was just being nice and seeing my sister. Well, this is a beautiful thing. It's all great. But the curly fries. The curly fries are so good. So let's look here. So it doesn't mean 12 of something. But you just naturally, like, I want you to think how... Sometimes they're like, oh, I'm not a math person, this is that. But think how sophisticated. I just said, if my daughter brought home two dozen cats, how many heart attacks would I have? And you said 24. Oh, sorry, how many cats would she have? And you said 24. And think about what sophisticated math that is. How did you know that if one dozen is 12, two dozen is 24, what'd you do? 12 and 12, right? Okay, what else could you have done? Did anyone not add 12 to 12? Did anyone do something a little different? Instead of adding, what's the other way you could approach it? By the way, adding's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But you're going to find that because we work with really big numbers, sorry? Beautiful. Times two, which means we're going to do what? Okay. When we're dealing with ratios, when we're dealing with recipes, when we're dealing with big numbers, we don't add very often. Because if you wanted to do six dozen, you'd have to do 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12. Well, that's fine for 12s, right? But what if you had to do, oh, I don't know, a trillion, and you have to punch in all those zeros, plus a trillion, plus a trillion, plus, it's going to be a nightmare, right? So instead of adding, I like Hannah's idea. Hannah said to add, which is great, but Hannah said, what well, if we multiplied? And I got to say, I like Hannah's idea more than Hannah's idea. Um, you can interpret that however you like. So here's the thing. I'm going to teach you a skill that if you took nine or ten science with me, I would have taught you then, but I don't know if any of you did. Um, but called dimensional analysis. I learned this in university, and it changed my life, and I thought, why didn't my high school teachers teach me this? Um, and now it's the only way I teach working with units. It's the only way I teach. I teach this whole course with dimension, and here's what it means. What we're going to do is this. Anytime we want to convert from one unit to another, whatever that may be, unit just means what we're talking about. All we're going to do is something called dimensional analysis, and here's what we do. We're going to write down the number we start with. And I'm going to write this down specifically with, one do with the cat's question. And then I'm going to write the general version too. What we're going to say is, my daughter threatened to get two dozen cats. Okay, and I'm going to do the science thing. 
where we subscript it so we know what we're talking about. Remember when we said like grant, like we said like we could talk about the molar mass of beryllium? Yes. Um, when you were talking about well, for anything it doesn't equal 12, uh, what about a baker's dozen? It's 13, but that's a different thing. That's not a dozen, that's a baker's dozen, but that's true. I know, but I'm saying a dozen bakers, it can't be a dozen of bakers. Okay, so okay, bakers. okay, but that's not a dozen bakers, it's a baker's so dozen. Just, ah, focus, this I'm is complicated, Shh, quiet. Okay, so at first this is gonna seem weird. But any time we do math in this whole course, here's what you're going to do. You're going to write down what you start with. All right? We're just going to write down our starting number, and we're going to put next to it always the starting unit. All right? Every math we do in this course, we're not going to treat units like some little leftover thing we throw on at the end. We're going to do our math with the units. Does that make sense? Because the units tell you how to do the math. Right? Your math teachers don't tell you that because they don't work with real units because they have their head ups in the cloud doing like theoretical math. But we don't do theoretical math. We do math in the real world. And in the real world, the nice thing is the answer you're trying to get actually tells you what math to do. Does that make sense? When you get good at this, it's going to blow your mind. At first, it's going to seem weird. You got to trust me. Do you trust me? Just say yes. yes. No, seriously, do. Because I promise you, at first, it's going to seem like extra work that seems like a waste of time. But with practice, this is going to make you better at math. It's going to make you better at science. And you're going to use this your whole life. You may never do chemistry again, but I promise, I use this all the time in my restaurant job. I use this all the time in my wood shop. I use this all the time. I use this all the time when I buy uh, like, a, like a cleaning product and it tells you how much to mix with how much water. And you're like, but I don't need that much. Or like, oh, but I need more than that. Like just, I promise, this is the most useful thing I'll ever teach you. So stick with me. So what we do is this. All we do is we look at the units. We ignore the numbers, all right? So one, write your given. Write your starting number and unit. Then, write times and a big fraction line. Write times a fraction. And then three, we're going to work with our units. What we're going to do is this. We're going to say, I don't want to talk about the starting unit. So I'm going to put them at the bottom of the fraction. Because the bottom of a fraction means dividing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to divide it away. Because when you divide something by itself, it disappears, right? 2 divided by 2 is 1. 8 divided by 8 is a million divided by a million is. And weirdly, a dozen cats divided by a dozen cats is 1. When you divide anything by itself, it disappears. So you're going to take the unit you don't want. We're going to put the starting unit. In other words, the one we don't want on the bottom. No numbers. No numbers. We put the starting unit on the bottom of our fraction. And on the top, we put the unit we want. So in this case... I don't want to know about a dozen cats. I just want to say, how many cats is that? Does that make sense? You put the unit you want to talk about on the top and the unit you don't want to talk about on the bottom. And these two units are always going to match. Because the whole point is this fraction's job is to get rid of this unit and replace it with a unit that you don't want. And then you put the numbers in the fraction, and I say, put a fact in the fraction. The fraction has nothing to do with your situation. The fraction is a fact. So what's a fact about cats and dozens of cats? Well, we have the fact here. How many cats are in a dozen cats? Great, and we're going to say it out loud. We're going to say there's 12 cats in one dozen cats. This doesn't have anything to do with our question because we don't have one dozen cats. What do we have? Two. But this is just the fact about cats and dozens. Does that make sense? The fraction isn't about your question. The fraction is about these two things, which is why we put the units down first and then put the numbers in. Does that make sense? And again, it's a little weird. And then you just do the math. And when we say do the math, what that means is get our calculator and we're going to do 2 times 12 and then what does a fraction mean? A fraction tells you to do what operation? Divide. So you're going to do 2 times 12 divided by 1. So 2 times 12. Uh, and then 
you're going to divide it by that number. And yeah, and this one, 2 times 12 is 24. 24 divided by 1 is 24. And we can say we have 24, and then we look at the units. And in the units, dozen cats cancels with dozen cats, and the only unit left over is cats. Now, is that an easier way to do this question? No. That's a much harder way to do this question, right? But when you get to ones where you can't in your head go, oh, well, 12 cats and 12 more cats is 24, when you get to tricky ones, this method is going to change your life. I promise. And if it seems stressful now, trust me, we're going to practice a lot. I'm going to talk you through it. I'm going to talk you through it. You're going to be good at it. All right. Let's look at another example. How many people would be in a crowd of 32.5 dozen? Now, I bet you can't do that in your head. Maybe you can. 32 and a half dozen. Maybe you could sit there and go one dozen is 12, two dozen is 24, and keep going. You could write it down maybe. But let's try what we just did. And I'm going to write the kind of rule again. We do the starting number with the starting unit. So in this case, what is the starting number? What do we actually have? Another way to say the starting number is what do you actually have in front of you? Well, in this case, what do we actually have in front of us? 32 and a half dozen people. And with the unit, we want to be specific. It's dozen people. And I'm just going to put PPL for people. Does that make sense? Because I'm lazy. If you want to write the word people, go nuts. And then what do we immediately do? We write down what we start with, and then what do we do? Times a fraction line. All right? Times a fraction line. Don't think about it. Then the next thing we do is we work with the units. What don't we put yet? No, hashtags. What the hell is that? No, what's that symbol? What do we put here? We're, next, we're going to work with the units, but what aren't we going to put yet? No numbers yet, just units. What we're going to say is, what don't I want to talk about anymore? What unit don't I want? In this case, I don't want to know how many dozen people. So the unit I don't want, where do I put it? On the bottom. So we're going to say, I don't want to talk about dozens of people. I want to talk about how many people, which again, I'm putting PPL. Does that make sense? So the old unit which is the same as the starting one, goes on the bottom. And what goes on the top? Our new unit. Then, and only then, so first we put all this in. Then we put the units in, right? And only after we've done that do we put the numbers in. Does that make sense? And the numbers just have to be a fact. And this is the same fact as last time. How many people are in a dozen people? Don't worry about 32 and a half. What's the relationship between a dozen of something and just that thing? There's 12. And is this right? Read that aloud. Say this fraction for me. This says that one people is 12 dozen people. Is that true? No. See the other thing that's nice about this? You never have to go, do I multiply or divide? Put your numbers in and then say it out loud. And if it sounds ridiculous, you've screwed it up. Does that make sense when I do this? Great. I've got 32 and a half dozen people. I don't want to talk about dozen people. I want to talk about people. And I know that one people is 12 dozen. Right? You say that out loud and you go, oh, that clearly isn't right. So I put the numbers in the wrong place. So what we do every single time, and listen, when I write the final exam, the kids who do well, you know what I see them doing writing their exam? and they race and they switch. They mouth it to themselves, they say it out loud. If you say it out loud, if you've put something stupid in here, you'll go, well, that doesn't make sense, right? So instead, what is true? Well, it's true that 12 people is how many dozen? One. And then how would I actually do this math? How do I plug this into my calculator? We start with the starting number, which in this case is 32.5, and then what do we do? Times 12, and in this case, it doesn't matter, but even still, what would we do next? Divide by one. Use the division symbol just so we all. Oh, 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 what I. Oh, I'm silly. Never mind. I'm just going to use the stupid slash. Sorry. And what do we get? 390. All right. 390 people is 32 and a half dozen people. By the way, 390 carrots would be 32 and a half dozen carrots. And 390 orangutans. 
would be 32 and a half dozen orangutans. Right? It doesn't matter what you're counting. With counting numbers, you can count anything. Does that make sense? The dozen isn't actually the whole unit. You have to say it's dozen of something. That's the whole unit. Does that make sense? Um, let's take a look at this one. Let's try one more. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. If you haven't ever read the Gettysburg Address, you should. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of writing ever done. But we want to know four score years. And score is another one of these counting numbers. And remind me, score is another way of saying 20. Okay? So what we want to know is four score years. How many actual years is that? So I write the given. Then I write multiply by a fraction line. Do I put numbers in here now? No. no. What do I put first? The four numbers, always. We looked here. We said, okay. We put our starting number and our starting unit. Then we make this fraction and we deal with the units first. And I put the new unit on top and the starting unit, the unit I want to get rid of, goes on the bottom. So here, what's going to go on top? What's going to go on the bottom? It would, but I don't want to do it that way. I want to do, I want to do it this way. Because again, we're going to get to ones you can't do in your head, I promise. So how do I set it up? What um, unit do I want to get rid of? And what is that here? How many score years? Which, again, is not a way we're used to talking, right? So that's okay. And instead, I just want to know years, right? Does that make sense? And we can put these numbers in. Uh, now we're ready. We need to put a fact here. And again, this fact has nothing to do with our question, nothing to do with the fact that we're four of them. How many years are in a score? Well, a score is always 20. So I could say one year is 20 score years. Did I do that right? No, because when you read out loud, it sounds stupid. Where do the numbers go? 20 years is one score. And I want to show you one more thing. Watch this. Maybe, just give me two seconds, because this is where we're going to pick up tomorrow, is I can do this twice in a row, and I can just keep going. Maybe I don't want to know how many years. Maybe I want to know in months. I can actually do this again, because now, what am I talking about? <coughs> but wait a minute. If I don't want years, I can just do it again. Another fraction line. What unit don't I want? What unit don't I want? Now, years, where do I put it? And on the top, what do I put? Hey, do I know a fact for that? Do I know a relationship between months and years? Yes. How many months in a year? 12 months in. And just before you leave, just watch. So now when we go to do the math, I start with 4, and then I multiply by 20. Oh, nice. And then what do I do with the 1? What's that line mean? So divide by 1. Then I multiply by? And then I divide by 1. And look at that. Four score years is 960 months, all in one step. And look, was that hard to do on my calculator? Whereas if I give you equations, if I gave you conversion factors, it would be so easy to screw this up. But see how easy that is? That's what we're going to carry on with tomorrow. And once you get the hang of it, you're going to find this so easy. And by the way, did this question have anything to do with chemistry? Nothing whatsoever. That's because dimensional analysis isn't just useful in your chemistry classes. They should have started teaching you this in grade five. This is how we convert units. This is how we work with ratios. And it changes your life. What's it change? Your life. How's it change your life? It makes it better. That's how it changes your life. How you doing? You missed yesterday, yeah? Um, I have a copy of the note right there. Um, it's online. I'll put the video. Do you know how to get to uh, the OneNote? Like, do you have it on your phone or?